Good morning, everyone. We're continuing with how to work with people based on Swami's wonderful little book, The Art of Supportive Leadership. So let us begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, dear friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to you all. Help us to feel your living presence within, guiding and blessing us, helping us to know right from wrong, best from worst, better from the most terrible, that we may move step by step ever closer to your infinite blissful light. Om. Peace. Amen. The thing about this leadership, and it's not emphasized that much in this book, but it's also true. We're also leaders of our own leaders of our own minds. We are um, we are a whole a whole urban area of mental citizens, and by no means are all of them in agreement. Uh, by no means are all of them pulling in the same direction. So the uh, understanding of how to magnetize and to win disparate forces together and mold them into one moving force is, is completely true, even if you're just a, a corporation of one. It's like, who's in charge? Uh, we tend to think of ourselves, I, I, I use the athletic um, image, not that I'm much of a sportswoman, but we tend to think of ourselves as a single long distance runner. But in fact, within our own consciousness, we're an entire soccer team with all the different players, all the different parts, everything that has to be worked on. And so knowing how to magnetize our own energy into a focus line is as, mu as important as it is to be able to work with others. So I haven't, as I said, I haven't talked about these principles that much because they don't all apply directly. But if we get to be a good leader um, with other people, we'll find that it works on herself. I'm not sure if I've shared this thought already, but in, just in case I haven't, let me do it. Um, I ha have had to struggle in my life with intense self-criticism, and, and it's paralyzed my, me in lots of ways. Um, guilt and regret and all sorts of things. It's it, after all these years of of effort, you know. It's it's it's. I well, I don't want to presum be presumptuous and say it's behind me, but it's it's largely behind me, or the most terrible part of it is behind me. Um, I'm still susceptible, as everyone is, to feeling. Oh, I wish I could have done that better. But this context is, there was a woman friend of mine. We lived together in the convent. We were very good friends. And um, I just had the karma with her to just to never judge her and to never feel, um, never feel, never to never lose hope for her ability to succeed and, and succeed on every level, spiritually or in her actions, whatever it might be. I just had full confidence that light would triumph in her life. And whatever she did, it never seemed significant to me. And she was she did a lot of things that other people thought of as quite significant in terms of negativity, but they never struck me that way. I just had an unconditional loving faith and love in her, for her. And it occurred to me one day that she presented to me foibles and failures that were at least as big and in many cases worse than my own transgressions. But my attitude toward her transgressions was completely different than my attitude toward my own. And I hit upon this idea that actually was enormously helpful to me and that I still use. 
of not her specifically, but I would pretend when something had happened that involved me personally, I would pretend, and it was and it was negative, and it was pulling my energy down. I would pretend that it wasn't I who had done it, but it was her. And I would pretend that it was she who had come to me, described the whole situation, and wanted my response. And my response to her always was, well, you know, it could have been better, but it's going to be fine. You're going to pull through it. You're going to learn from it. You're going to get stronger from it. I was always her cheerleader, and I was always positive. But toward myself, I behaved completely differently. And so I started actually literally letting her tell me the story in my mind. Let her tell me the story of my own transgressions and then see how I responded. And it was a marvelous way, well, to do what Swami's suggesting here. Put aside my own feelings, put aside my own desires, be aware of my feelings, but be impersonal where I myself was concerned, but sensitive to other people's realities. I mean, what did my friend need from me? She didn't need further scolding. As Swami says, sometimes people feel that when a person has fallen, that your job is to push them even farther down. He said, it's just the opposite. When somebody has fallen, your job is to help them rise again so that they can overcome it. So I began to see that that was how I needed to treat myself. I needed to help myself just face into it, not be afraid, but just face into it but then stay positive. I remember when a friend of mine was trying to help me, and at that time I was procrastinating uh, making some decisions. I had a hard time making decisions at that point for myself, especially for future, for the future. And I was actually setting up a whole lecture tour, and I just had to make decisions today for where I was going to be in four months. And I just couldn't make the decisions. I kept pro procrastinating, there's no other word. And my friend became quite alarmed because the consequences of my procrastination were going to begin to start piling up and falling over each other. So they thought to help me by telling me what a catastrophe I was setting up for myself. Well, I already knew I was setting up a catastrophe and I was just neurotic. I was psychologically very complex. And I was just running this whole thing. So they tried to help me by scaring me even more because that's what worked for them. <laughs> but uh, I finally said, you know, I don't need to have this explained to me. I need someone to say, you can do it. Don't be afraid. You can do it. I needed somebody to cheerlead and have a positive attitude toward me. Fortunately, my friend figured it out perfectly and treated me appropriately ever thereafter. But that's what we all need. And when we find ourselves unable to be our own cheerleader, pretend we're helping someone else. I mean, like what doesn't work with others is not going to work with you either. Another one of my little syndromes, which was very interesting when I finally unraveled it. Um, and this, is, this has to do with what we talked about yesterday, which is humility, which is also the theme we're going to be going with today somewhat is I just had a false idea of my own ability. And because I had some talent, seemingly, or potential talent, I just expected myself to be perfect at everything I did. And surprise, surprise, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't by a long shot. So as a consequence, because the self-image I held for myself was entirely unrealistic, I always got to fail. There was just no possibility I could ever succeed because I was trying to, to be someone who didn't exist. And so my response would be to try to bully the person or be angry or be depressed or guilty, all those very unhelpful attitudes, thinking that if I pounded on this inept individual, which was me, enough, then suddenly this per perfectly competent individual would emerge from the ashes. And it took me longer than I'm proud to say, to finally have to say one day, um, what you see is what you are. And all of the rest of this is just some weird um, arrogance that is going to make you miserable for the rest of your life. So I just brought my expectations down to realistic. And, you know, I'm not a terrible person, so realistic wasn't 
I didn't, didn't turn me into the devil. Realistic just made me an ordinary average person. But an ordinary average person who actually existed was much better than this superhero that was never, ever, ever going to come forward. So once again, if you're working with other people and you're constantly trying to bully them into having talents or abilities that they simply don't possess, no amount of bullying them is ever going to get it from them. And if you're a good leader, you figure out what can they contribute. You know, what talents and skills do they bring to the table? And how can I support them and inspire them to use those instead of making them always feel that they have failed too? You can see it doesn't work and then roll it back to yourself and everything will work better. So Swami now was talking and I'm going to read the paragraph I read yesterday first. Part of the skill of leadership is knowing how many of the trappings of leadership one may safely ignore without risking the loss of one's followers' respect and cooperation. The stronger the leader, the fewer the symbols he will need. The weaker the leader, correspondingly, the more he will need. On the other hand, a relatively weak leader would be mistaken to rely too much on outward symbols, if only because their excessive number will only advertise the fact of his weakness. We don't fool people. People are not as dumb as we think. <laughs> they, they see right through us. Lord Nelson of Trafalgar, Trafalgar, Trafalgar fame used to refer to his captains as a band of brothers. That's that beautiful phrase that we hear often. So his captains, who were lower in rank than he was, as a band of brothers, meaning with him. But it was because he commanded their complete respect that he could afford to be so inclusive. And they loved him all the more for it because he, he didn't set himself apart from them, but they gave him that respect because they intuitively knew it, because he manifested it by his actions and his attitudes. By contrast, I knew a man who commanded no respect at all in his own home, but who tried ineffectively to assert his authority by shouting at every meal, This home is my castle! It's interesting that Swami brings it all of a sudden back to the home and, and respect and leadership, which reminds us that this is how to get along with people. And every single thing that we've said applies to being a husband, a wife, a parent, or even a dutiful child, but more likely the ones who are in authority. And you can just shout it as often as you want. This is the story I told yesterday of the person who wanted me to establish them as a necessary link in the chain of uh, work progress. But it can't be dictated by authority. It has to be won by magnetism. Humility is a sign of strength, not of weakness. Humility is, above all, and quite simply, truthfulness, self-honesty. I talked about that at length yesterday. It is not the false mod modesty of one retreating shyly into the limelight. That was a phrase that Swami liked to use. Oh, I'm not important, I'm not important, I'm not important, as we move ever more into the spotlight. <laughs> And sometimes people in positions of authority, thinking that somehow that's the way to carry it out, are yet involved and attached to their position, but they feel that they should constantly be repudiating that position simultaneously. It just creates total confusion, backing shyly into the limelight, as Aswami puts it. It isn't, in other words, the sort of humility that was expressed in the introduction written by a French archaeologist to a book by one of his colleagues. Praising the book, this scholar wrote, the author's distinguished work was done at our direction and under our constant supervision. <laughs> that was something that was something Swami enjoyed with his own father. There was this his father brought this book to his attention and how the 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 man who wrote the introduction he first he praised the book at great length and then pointed out modestly that of course it was all done under my supervision. It's just um, 
that's embarrassingly childish is what it really is. Which it wasn't true either because the, scholar, the, other, the author deserved the credit for the book. Humility means seeing everything quite simply as it is with none of the emotional overtones of wishing that it be anything more. That's what I was talking about in this false self-image that I labored under for a very long time. I just wanted to be something I wasn't. And, you know, very few people are actually notable. Most of us are just, well, mediocre, perfectly ordinary. I know a woman friend of mine who labored under some of the same delusions that tortured me. When she finally, I explained to her when I finally broke some of that, my mantra about myself became, I'm a pretty nice person. <laughs> I wasn't a real nice person, but I was a pretty nice person. And it just, I was just relaxing into the lowest possibility, knowing there could be a little more than that. But if I could just be comfortable at the bottom of my possibilities, then it would take all that tension away. Everything else would be extra. And her phrase became um, that she was perfectly adequate. And again, she'd been always laboring to be this sort of mighty superhero that was never going to manifest. But she realized she was perfectly adequate for everything that she was doing. And, and adequate became just this delightful word that she would remind herself of whenever she needed to. Um, humility means seeing everything quite simply as it is, with none of the emotional overtones of wishing that it be anything more. It was a very simple principle. Uh, aphorism you should also memorize. Reality always wins. And we can fight against it as much as we want, but reality always wins. So we need to be practical and efficient in the way we approach things. A job done is simply a job done. It is the egotist who looks around for applause. That's how Swami puts it. That's also perfect. Yes, of course, people say, but it's natural to want to be recognized. Well, it may be natural, but it's not wholesome. It's especially not wholesome for a leader. And, you know, one should be supportive. One should um, give credit to one's co-workers and one's subordinates, definitely. One should not stint on giving them credit and praise where it's due. But don't overdo it either. Because when you overdo it, your words lose magnetism. And when you overdo it, it's like, what are, you trying to, what are you trying to prove here? In other words, truth. Be exceedingly truthful. Give everybody full credit for every good thing that they do, but be measured in your praise. People will treasure what you say to them much more if they know that it's completely sincere and not merely just bubbling over like a pot on the stove. Swamiji was... Um, extremely attentive to supporting us for the good work that we did, but he was always exactly truthful. Therefore, you had absolute faith in what he said. There was no part of you that felt that he was flattering you or trying to get something from you. I used to do writing for various things, and much of my writing was not accepted at the time. I had to learn. But whenever he said something was good, I, I always knew that it really was good. He would say, this is, he would literally, he would say, this is okay. This is good. This is very good. This is excellent. And each one of those was precise. And so I could actually also learn that this was good, good enough, which is what okay meant. And this one was good, so it was better. And I could learn why it was better. And then when it was excellent... I, I learned to tell what that really looked like as opposed to when it was merely good. And I never doubted his appraisal. because it, and, and then there are other people that I know in my life who just heap too much praise. And then as a consequence, you never really quite know where you stand, especially when you watch them heaping praise indiscriminately on many people. Then you, you don't really quite know where you stand. And that's not good in a leader. In a people, a people need to be able to trust a leader to be telling a, the sincere and complete truth at all times. Um, 
And I love that phrase. It's the egotist who looks around for applause. And we do. But it's a tendency that needs to be mastered. As Swami says, the inclination for self-importance is, is inherent in us, but it's a false inclination. Andrew Carnegie revealed this kind of humility as self-honesty when he attributed his great success in business to his ability to attract a good team of workers. And he's right. It was like he had the leadership ability to attract them, but it was their presence that made him successful. My father, Ray P. Walters, showed it too, offered the Legion d'Honneur for his, the Legion of Honor, the Legion of Honor medal for his discovery of oil in um, near Bordeaux, France. He replied completely sincerely, it was teamwork that found it. The members of our team were all equally responsible. And that was, I knew Ray personally, that was his manner. He was very competent. He was very um, committed to excellence. But he was a team player. And he recognized that he was just one. Humility was a quality of Abraham Lincoln, accused in court by his opposing attorney of being two-faced, Lincoln replied wryly, I leave it to the honorable jury. If I had two faces, would I be wearing this one? <laughs> if you can turn something to humor, it really it's a marvelous way to say it. <laughs> Humility in leadership can be achieved also if one learns to view his role as a simple service to others. Indeed, this is the very essence of leadership, giving energy, not receiving it. And perhaps the surest way to ensure such an outward flow of energy is to think of oneself always as serving one's subordinates. I'm here to make it work for you. I'm here to make it work for you. And that will endear you to your subordinates and will result in great success. Finally, and provided you have the faith, most help have the faith, most helpful of all, see God as the doer. Give him the credit for any good that you do. Offer your work as a service to him. And serve others because of serve others as representatives of the divine in your life. So God as God is the doer is the final secret of greatness in everything that we do. We are part of a greater reality. Where does our energy come from? Where does opportunity come from? Where does inspiration and ideas come from? Where does positive magnetism, even the ability to love, where does it come from? And these are the deeper questions that we have to always ask ourselves. Swami doesn't emphasize the divine aspect of things that much in this book. He even wrote it as J. Donald Walters so that people wouldn't feel they have to take up yoga in order to, to use these principles. But when it all comes down to the end, what is the true basis for humility? The true basis for humility is to realize that um, I'm just, well, Swami used to talk sweetly about this woman in India, um, this elderly woman in India who used to listen to spiritual discourses over the radio in the past when radio was a, big, a bigger medium. And she would then garland when, when, the, when the program that came through was particularly inspiring, she would put a garland around the radio, just like being so grateful to the radio because inspiration had been delivered to her from a person she couldn't see, so she couldn't give the garland to the person, so she gave the garland to the radio. And Swamiji often spoke of himself in that way. He said to, to praise me, for what has come through me is like that woman putting the garland on the radio. He, you know, Swami accepted the fact that he was the instrument that received and transmitted the broadcast, but he never saw himself as the originator of the broadcast. You see, there's a great difference. He played a part, and he was exceedingly determined and wholehearted in the part he played. He, there, was, there wasn't anything passive about the way Swamiji took on the role that Master had given him, but always in his consciousness, and not just as an affirmation, 
he was he was doing it he was doing it for master in the sense that he was serving his guru by everything he did but he was doing it for master in the sense that master wasn't physically present so therefore master needed a physically present instrument to write the books to give the talks to counsel the people to lead the community everything everything that swami did he only saw himself as the radio receiving the broadcast and it and it is exactly true god and gurus are this constantly radiating reality you you might if you want to think of it you can think of it as a lighthouse that just stations itself and continually emanates this bright beam and the ships and the people how they relate to that that lighthouse whether they stand in the light or stand in the shadow is the choice that they make but the lighthouse itself is unwavering in the way it puts out the energy so that's why in the bible of st john um john says about jesus to all who received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of god because the power of jesus to transform consciousness was literally infinite so and and undifferentiated it was offered without reservation just like the lighthouse but the individuals well even to the present day the degree to which that transforming power actually changes our lives is the degree to which we are able to receive it so it's all about our ability the the god and guru's energy is unchanging it's our ability to tune into it and then as we become more enlightened in our relationship to that energy we recognize that we are literally just the just a pass through just a window and that all inspiration comes from a higher source and all we have to do is not not interfere with it swami ji would constantly over many years he would he would enumerate all the things that he was able to do and people who didn't understand thought that he was bragging that he was the egotist looking for the applause but he wasn't he was trying to demonstrate and to inspire us with an understanding that god is limitless in his ability to act if we but open ourselves to him and then swami would say and then i had to you know write these music for this album which had to be recorded so i put my attention at the spiritual eye and i asked master to give it to me and then there it was and he was saying that because that which i do ye shall do and greater things and the constant example of swami and the constant reminder to us that all we have to do is tune in caused us all to just gradually come to a clearer and clearer understanding of the simple fact that it isn't me and i was talking about that also yesterday to return to the subject of an earlier chapter you will also find it easy in this case to give god the blame not in a spirit of accusation but in the thought that if a project fa- failed maybe it did so for a good reason this is what is trying to happen indeed those who look even mindedly on both success and failure and to give give everything to god generally find that all things in some uncanny fashion turn out for the best swami says at the end of this chapter see leadership is only a job like any other leadership means giving service giving service not receiving it humility is more important in a leader than any medal for achievement humility is self honesty if you have religious faith see god is the doer view your work as a service to him god bless you my friend